level of people that don't know God is the area of anxiety and depression. Man, I, it, it seems like I talk to people all the time, and, you know, they're telling me, man, I, I've been going through stuff, and especially these last few years, you know. So there's always a reason for it, right? There's always a reason. Um, by the way, whoever has an envelope you want to, don't mind me, you can come up and throw it here. So, yeah, you won't be disturbing me. There you go. Um, so, <coughs> excuse me. So, um, there's, there's a reason why people uh, suffer anxiety and, and depression, which, by the way, they are two different things. Anxiety and depression are not the same. We're going to get into that uh, in a minute. Um, but it dawned on me that, that this ought not to be, you know, because I can understand people in the world, they really don't have any uh, 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 resources unless they go to psychiatrists or therapists and all that kind of stuff. And trust me, you know, I'm, I don't have anything against those things. Uh, if anybody is dealing with that and they see a therapist, you know, that, that's fine. But let me equip you in the Word so you can work your way out of that. Amen? Because I believe the Word of God is the only answer to any problem. It is the truth, and the truth will make us free. It is the thing that will cause us to, to break through any situation in life. Amen? Amen. And so... Um, and so I realized this is a, we've just been through a pandemic, right? And this, this is another pandemic, which is not a virus, or maybe it is, I don't know. But so many people are suffering from anxiety and depression that is, is concerning. Amen. So let me tell you the difference between anxiety and depression. Are you all ready? Okay, anxiety involves excessive worry or stress about the outcome of a situation. So that means it is situational. Anxiety just doesn't just happen. It happens as a result of whatever situation you're dealing with. Or, or better yet, the outcome of that situation. If, it's a, if you know that it's going to be a good outcome, then you don't stress. But if your thinking is going to be a negative outcome, then you're going to stress. And now, trust me that a lot of times we're thinking about the outcome without it actually happening. If it's an outcome, it means it's going to happen. It hasn't happened yet. So, so sometimes people that, that are prone to worry, they worry about things that haven't happened yet. Y'all stay with me. They get anxious about the possibility of something going wrong. And before you know it, that becomes like a mindset. And whatever they experience in life, they already concluded something negative is going to happen. And then when it doesn't happen, what a relief. You know, you go, oh, thank God. You know, well, you could have saved yourself all that stress. Come on, somebody. Right? Because you, you don't have to go through that, but that is anxiety. Anxiety uh, is when you're being pulled in two directions. Maybe it'll work out and maybe it won't. Now, the reason I'm saying that it's different for a believer is because of ex exactly that. We are believers. Believers in what? Believers in what God says. So if I believe what God says, that has to be my niche. That I have to go there. I have to walk there. I walk by faith and not by sight. So everything that is happening in terms of anxiety and the word of God is what? Mindsets. Yeah. Because the Bible says that you can have a mindset that becomes a stronghold. Right? And Paul said in Corinthians, he said, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God in pulling down of strongholds. And I said before that, that, that we've allowed people to, to determine what a stronghold is or define a stronghold who had no idea what they were talking about. 
they would actually use that same scripture, I believe in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, um, to say that the stronghold is uh, uh, whatever, a city or a place or, you know, demons at some place. And, and, and keeping it in context, it's not talking about that. Because after he says pulling down a stronghold, he says, take every thought captive. So where's the stronghold? Bingo. Yeah. And so when we allow anxiety to fill our minds, if, if, notice I use the word allow because we don't have to allow it. If we did not have the authority to stop it, I will end this message now and let's go eat. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is, I've said this a thousand times, right? That the thing that makes us like God, we've been made in his what? Image and in his likeness. What makes us like God is our ability to think and to make decisions. I love to watch those animal shows. And they, they, they look like they're really thinking it out, but it's more instinctive. They got great instincts, right? But that's not us. We've been made in the image of God. We have a mind. We can think. And so most people allow the, their mind to take them somewhere. Come on. Are we good so far? Okay. I hope you don't lose your appetite after this. No, seriously. You think you're thinking, but you're not. Because what, what's happening in your mind is what's been happening for, for most of our lives. is already dictating what you th should think about and how you should react to things. So it's, it's, we call it reactive thinking. Reactive thinking is not of God. <laughs> Hello? Proactive thinking is of the Lord. Because when you react to things, it's really not you. Your mind goes into that mold uh, that says, this is the way you handled it before. Just handle it. Or it will say, let's just see what happens. Well, you're all so quiet. If you take on that attitude, let me see what happens, you may not like what happens but you're allowing it to happen because the Bible says we have to, what the mind of Christ. And so anxiety is coming from a, a, a place that is not biblical. Anxiety is coming from a place of the fallen Adam. Fallen Adam was awesome in his relationship with God before he fell. I mean, they had a great relationship. They would talk and so on and so forth. When he ate of the fruit, he reacted Reactive thinking started right there. He ran, he hid, he covered, covered himself. God didn't change his mind. God still loved him the same. Are y'all here? The Bible says God will come and meet with him every day. And God came to meet with him, meaning God knew what he did, but it didn't change God. Adam, where are you? Well, I hid because I was afraid. Reacted. And I know what I'm telling you. Uh, guys, is not easy. The Bible calls it in Romans chapter 12, the renewing of the mind. And the renewing of the mind is not easy. We have the mind of Christ, but you have to start that process of fighting the fight of faith concerning your mind and concerning the things that go on in your mind. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? It really has to do, anxiety has a lot to do with perspective. What perspective do we have? Do we think that, that things, you know, can, can go on in our mind and take us into places that we shouldn't go and there is no, no remedy to it? No, my friend. The Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, what? The mind is powerful. And you know what makes it even more powerful? When you take what's in your mind and you speak it. Hey. So if you're going through stuff, you know what? 
please, please don't let it come out your mouth. Because when it comes out your mouth, it is powerful. It will transform things. The mouth, it, the tongue is creative. And so a lot of what we see that we think about, when we speak it, it makes it come to pass. Come on. Yeah. So we go like, man, I'm not feeling good. I, I feel terrible. Um, I don't know. I, I, I feel like nothing is changing. Okay, battle that in your mind. Take every thought captive while it is still here. Because the moment you go to somebody and say what you thought, oh, you're not hearing me. Come on. The power of life and death is where? In the tongue. I've said it before. The world was void in the beginning in Genesis chapter 1. It was dark, void, and all that kind of stuff. God wanted to change it. And he could have did this and changed it. But he was trying, the Bible was trying to teach us how God operates. And because we are sons and daughters of God is how we should operate. So what did he do to the world? He spoke to it. Light be. Are y'all here? If it's good enough for God, it's good enough for us. Just like you can speak positive and you can speak the word, you can speak death and you can speak lies. Come on. But where? It always starts where? Right here. Are y'all with me? The battle is in the mind. Come on. So, anxiety is situational. Uh, you know, I always say um, that we should always be thinking prevention. Right? So, the, the idea is find thoughts. Everybody has a weakness. Some people have fear that they're going to be broke for the rest of their lives. Some people have fear that they're going to get sick. Are y'all here? Yeah, people are different. Well, whatever it is that, that you feel is tugging at you, find scripture that counters that. Come on. And before you get to the place where it attacks your mind, you are already uh, focusing on the word, speaking the word of God, and so on. That is prevention. Come on. Most of us deal with it after, afterwards is what I said. It's reactive. Come on. Y'all better put on your thinking cap. Think this through. So, um, depression is a different deal. Depression is a mood disorder and, uh, that causes overwhelming feelings of sadness or apathy. Let me say this right off the bat. You know, I've said, I've talked about the therapist. Let me talk to you about medication. Amen. We keep it real here. We, we ain't trying to fake the funk. So, you know, if people are on medication because they don't feel that they can deal with, with uh, depression and so on, hey, man, you know, don't stop taking it and then tell the doctor, my pastor says so. Yeah. <laughs> No, no, what I, I'm going to say it again. Let me equip you in the word so that you can wean yourself out of it. Come on. Because, because we have to realize that the word of God is the most powerful thing in the world, in the universe. Amen. But remember that for you to receive the word, you're going to have to do a little battle here. Got it? Okay, so first things first, we must be convinced that the Lord wants us to be healed. You know, the way, the way anxiety and those things work is that we, we convince ourselves that maybe God healed somebody else, but he won't heal me. Come on. Well, you know, and then we start thinking of all the negative. Well, this person said they believed God and they died. Come on. So in other words, we have tons of opportunities to be negative. It costs us nothing. 
But the benefits are awesome when we make up our minds that we're going to be positive in the Word of God, no matter what we see, how we feel, or what anybody says. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so we must be convinced that He wants us healed. It says in Matthew chapter 4, verse 23... It says, and Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of what? Of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Now, he didn't have to do that. His purpose in coming was to uh, reestablish the kingdom of God on the earth. His purpose in coming was to bring us back as sons and daughters to the Father. He didn't have to do this unless he did have to do it. Because if he was going to preach the kingdom, then they have to understand, they have to understand what the kingdom was about. The kingdom of God is different, guys. You have the world system and you have the kingdom of God. It's two different uh, 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 mentalities, two different things, and totally different. Totally different. So, uh, what he says, that he went around preaching the kingdom. And if he didn't heal the people, then the kingdom message was simply that, a message. But when he healed all kinds of sickness and disease, he was saying, this is what the kingdom of God is all about. The world can tell you that if you're sick, you stay sick. They can tell you if you have cancer, you die. They can tell you all these things. But in the kingdom, you have to believe that the kingdom represents the king. And the king is saying, I will heal you. And we must be totally convinced of that. We, we can't go like this, my friend. We can't say, well, yeah, yeah, he heals some and, and not others. Listen, speak for yourself. Don't speak for others. Declare in the name of Jesus that you are healed. Come on. Now, now you know, he wants us to, Matthew wants us to really get this. So in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, it says, it sounds almost the same. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of what? The kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. How many? Every? Yeah. Now, listen, guys, I've been around a long time. You know, um, I'm of the opinion that I'd rather die believing God than die not believing. It's the truth. You know, if I'm going to go, let me go believing, man. Let me go with a fight, you know, down with a fight. Not, not just uh, have no faith in God. Uh-uh. So why am I saying that? Because at some point, we're all going to heaven. You know, I, I just don't want it to be right now. <laughs> You know, I tell the Lord all the time, I want to see my grandkids grown and all this kind of stuff. But I am not afraid to die because to death to a believer is the ultimate healing. All right. All right. Now, that, that brought some anxiety to some folks right there. <laughs> fight it, baby. Fight it. Are you all with me? So. Let's look at an example of someone that was depressed in the Bible. Let me see. I actually got a, a watch right here, man. I don't know. Somebody put that here trying to give me. <laughs> no, I did that myself. First Kings chapter 19. We're going to read a little bit. Stay with me. It says, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Next verse. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Elijah was an awesome prophet, powerful, from day one. Um, the first time you hear about Elijah is in, in, uh, uh, in verse 17, I mean, uh, uh, chapter 17. Incredible. He took care of the prophets of Baal. He did all of that, but Jezebel was not impressed, and she basically said, you know what? Off with, with your head. So she threatened him. 
So, um, so it says, then Jezebel, I'll read it again, messenger to Elias saying, so let the gods do to me, and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time, next verse says, and when he saw that, that he, when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. So I want you to, I want you to get this. Elijah was an incredible prophet. I love the prophet Elijah. Powerful. Yet, Jezebel, which is a spirit, spoke to him and said, I'm going to kill you. you. I'm not impressed that you killed all the prophets, man. I'm going after you. So she put a hit on him. You know, they targeted him. But notice what he says. And when he saw, it didn't say when he heard. When he saw, that means that what he heard, he started thinking about it. And he started seeing himself being killed. Y'all need to hear me. He started focusing on these pictures in his mind that by the next day, he would have no head. And when we do that, it causes the same thing that, to do the same thing he did. The Bible says, then he arose and ran for his life. He went from being a powerful prophet to being someone that is running for his life, afraid, not so much what he heard, but what he allowed to take place in his mind. Are y'all here? So my question to you, my friend, is what is your vision? What do you see? Do you see the worst or do you see the best? Do you see, you, you see yourself failing or do you see yourself succeeding? Do you see yourself healed or do you see yourself sick? Come on. The power of focus is so important. Next verse says, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree, and he prayed that he might die. That's depression, my friend. And said, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Next verse. Then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. So let me tell you something about, about our experience when we're suffering from depression. We think nobody cares. We, we're done but yet God is working, as I shared before, and his provision never fails. You can feel like, what's a good word? Like crap? Okay, that's why Junior's here. And, and it doesn't mean that God feels the way you do. Or that God doesn't, doesn't, you know, he stops being God because of how we feel. The Bible says that he wanted to die and that the Lord told him, just take a rest and let me provide for you. So he sends an angel and he, and he does what? Gives him water and so on. Then he tells him, hey, come on, eat. Next verse. Then he looked and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate, he ate and drank and lay down again. Next verse. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, arise and eat because the journey is too great for you. Do you realize that the angels, my friend, they are encamped around you? Yeah. You don't, you don't see them. You don't feel them. But they're there. They have been assigned to you. And even at your worst, they are working at trying to provide for you, to strengthen you, to empower you. And this is what happened to Elijah. The next verse says, So he arose and ate and drank. And drank, and he went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. Next verse. And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? So the Lord told him to go, but he didn't tell him to go into a cave. A cave is dark and dank. A cave uh, you're, you're, is lonely. The cave represented the depression that he was going through. 
Are y'all here? And he goes in this cave and he's feeling sorry for himself and he wants to die. And the Lord speaks to him. And just like he does to some of us when we are at our worst. What are you doing there? In other words, what he's saying is, I didn't, I didn't tell you to go there. I didn't put you there. You put yourself in there because you allowed your mind to see something that was not true. Come on, somebody. He said, Elijah, what are you doing here? Next verse. So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, God of hosts, for the children of Israel has forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. So what he did was blame God. I know none of us do that, but you might know somebody. So he says, what are you doing there? Well, I'm here because I try to serve you. And this is what I got. <laughs> Come on, somebody. I mean, I was faithful. I, I wanted to, to, you know, to be there and, and do your work and so on and so forth. And now I'm here because in essence, what he was saying was this. You did not help me. Now, let me say something about that. Afterwards, the Lord provided for him, right? But what he was saying was, and sometimes people say this, Lord, I've been faithful, and now I'm in a situation, and you didn't help me. Hello? Well, first of all, he ended up in that cave because he wanted to go there. That's the way he felt. He never stopped. When, when Jezebel said what she said and, and stop and say, you know what? This is what I'm going to think about. I'm going to think about a God that has kept me. I'm going to think about a God who fed me. When there was a famine, the ravens came and gave me meat and, and the river gave me water. I'm going to talk. That's, that should have been his focus, but he changed his focus from a God, a good God, a God that provided for him, a God that was for him, a God that used him to a voice that said, you're going to die. Come on, somebody. Can I get some help? Oh. Next verse. Then he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. Everybody say, that's God. But it wasn't. <laughs> but the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind, an earthquake. So stop. So remember what I said. Uh, uh, Elijah was a powerful prophet. He called fire down from heaven. I mean, he was that type of prophet. Everything about Elijah was huge, you know, uh, uh, dramatic. Now the Lord says, go out. From, get out from the cave. And he causes an earthquake, strong winds, all of that. And Elijah was thinking, that's what I'm talking about. God is about to do something right now. That's the God that I know. Yeah, the supernatural. But the Bible says, but God was not in it. Do you realize, my friend, that sometimes we, we, we end up in caves. None of us are, you know, beyond that. At some point or another, you might get anxiety, you might get depressed, you find yourself in a cave, your whole perspective changes, you think nobody cares, you think you're the only one that is going through that and all that kind of stuff. Come on. But the, but the deal is that God is trying to teach you another level of relationship. Because when we go through stuff, I guarantee you that you will try everything you did before what worked one time. Okay, I'm going to fast three days. The last time I fasted three days, you know, man, I had my breakthrough. Are y'all here? And do you realize that God is not like that? We're like that, you know? But God is saying, man, you, you've gotten to that level, and now you want to stay on that level. You want to do what you've always done. 
And I'm trying to take you to another level. And it's what he was doing with, with Elijah. Oh, yeah, I know you remember this, Elijah. I know this is what you like, but I'm not in it right now. Next verse says, And after the earthquake of fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a what? Still, small voice. We have to go from the place of, you know, God, do this. Do this supernaturally. God, you know I need $100,000. Do it now. <laughs> I wish you would. You, know. you got 100 <laughs> Are you following me? And God says, uh -uh, I'm not even in that. But I remember the time that I needed this money, and you came through. And God is saying, right now I'm not in that. You're going to have to meet me over here. Because the bottom line, guys, is that we fight change. It's true. We don't want to, but we do. We fight getting out of the comfort zone. We don't want to, but we do. You know what I'm saying? And so he says, I'm not in the fire because prior to this, he was in the fire. When he called fire down upon the prophets of Baal, it burned all of them. And now he says, here's fire, but I'm not in it. What, what are you going through right now? I promise you that whatever you're going through is not for your demise. It's not the devil more powerful than God. It's none of that. A lot of times we go through stuff and God is saying, listen, I want to talk to you. But you want a prophet to come and shout it out. I hear the Lord saying, oh, yes, Lord. And God says, it ain't working that way no more. I want you to be still and know that I'm God. I want to speak a small voice that only you can hear. It can't be drowned out by, by all that you think I should do. Just be still. And know that I'm God. But if we're too busy worrying and being anxious and all that kind of stuff, we won't hear that voice. Watch it. Next verse says, So it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here? My friend, if you're, if you're in that place, hear what the Word of God is saying. If you're at that place, man, where you're struggling and you're depressed and, you know, you have anxiety and, and you don't know what's going on. And sometimes you're saying, man, Lord, it's better for me to be in heaven than here and all that kind of stuff. Listen, listen, listen to what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. He's saying, what are you doing there? Because... What he was trying to tell Elijah, like I said before, is you, you went in there on your own accord. I didn't take you there. And there's some people that go like, well, well, God has me in the wilderness right now. No, maybe you got yourself in the wilderness. Oh, come on. Oh, God has me in this place. Well, maybe you put yourself in that place. Because you don't know God on another level. Now he's trying to talk to you intimately and personally. But you're too worried. Or you want the, the, you know, you want the thunder and the earthquake and all that stuff. And he's saying, just sit down for a little bit. Come out the cave. Sit down. Relax. Come on. And he, again he says, what are you doing here? Watch the next verse. And he said, I have been very zealous, the same deal. I have been very zealous for the Lord, God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. So God is saying, what are you doing there? Let me justify why I'm here. No, really, that's what he was saying. Again, Elijah, what are you doing there? Let me justify why I'm here. I'm here because you did not help me after I did everything for you. I have been serving you for 10 years, 5 years, 40 years. 
And now I find myself here because you didn't do anything. That's what he was really saying. And we can justify, my friend, why we are where we are at times, but I would not advise it. Because God has plans for you. The Bible says he has plans for your good. He has plans to prosper you. He, come on, somebody. And, and if I'm in a place that I feel I should not be, you know what? I'm not going to justify why I'm there. What I'm going to say is, Lord, I'm going to be quiet, and I'm going to allow you to speak to me which way I should go. It's time for me to grow. It's time for me to mature to another level. But what? He complained, but the next verse says, Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way. This is one of the keys to overcoming anxiety and depression. He's complaining. The Lord is trying to help him to see it. Why are you here, man? Why are you here? Well, I'm here because he's crying, right, complaining and so on. And, uh, and then the Lord gives him the answer. But at face value, you think, how cold is God? Here I am crying, telling you, opening up my heart, this and that and the other. And the Lord's response is, go. Totally the opposite. If I was God, man, I would have been right there with him. Come here. Come here, Elijah. Poor Elijah. I know, I know, I know. Listen, man, I, I meant, I meant to, to say something, but <laughs> God is saying, I'm going to take care of your issue. And he says it to us. I want you to hear it. He says, go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Haziel as king over Syria. In other words, he was saying, stop crying, stop complaining, get back to the work of the ministry. Yeah. I wish there was another way. You know, truth be told, um, when we go through stuff, we're looking for the person or persons that will kind of agree with us. You know? Yes, I, you know, I understand. Yeah, I know God should have done something, man. He allowed you to go into that cave. I don't get it. <laughs> Why? Because then we feel better. But I want you to know that God's answer to anxiety and depression is this. I came and gave my life, went to the cross, paid the price, rose again to free you up, to make you sons and daughters, and to establish my kingdom here on the earth. And come on, somebody. And Jesus said, look at the field ripe for the harvest but the workers are few. He's saying, Elijah, I, I don't want to lose you like that. You were one of my favorites, man. I'm not, I'm not going to let you go down like that. He said, get back to work. When you get back to, to work in the ministry, then that depression will lift why? Because then your focus would be not in the cave, but in my kingdom. And remember, it's all about focus. When we focus on the wrong things, my friend, when, when we, that's why the Bible says, oh, you know, uh, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are passed away. And here it is. Behold, all things become new. You have to see it. And I know that's rough, but there's a lot of the scriptures, especially in the Psalms, where, where the Lord ministers to people and so on. You, know, you, you hear what I'm saying? But the fact of the matter is that when you are a believer and you signed up to be part of the kingdom, then God says, I want to use you. I need you. Hey. He says, it's time to go to the next level. I know you want miracles and you want the earthquake and you want all these things to happen. He says, I can do that. But right now I'm trying to be the Lord of your life. 
I'm trying to speak to your heart. I have a work for you. I have an assignment for you. And why do you think we do what we do? Why do you think that we have the growth tracks and, and, and we have, uh, you know, the dream team and, you know, all that kind of stuff? It's because we believe that the kingdom of God has to be advanced on the earth. And the only way that we're going to do it if, is if his people understand and believe that they have an assignment so you know what he thought his assignment was? Get in the cave. And God said, that's not your assignment. Your assignment is to go and anoint Hezekiah as king and, and, and anoint this person as a prophet. So this is what I always think, that if you have an issue, my friend, whether it's financial, find somebody that's worse off than you and bless them. That's the work of the kingdom. When you do that, my friend, you're going to be blessed. Come on. Yes? Amen? Lord, have mercy. Okay, I have a few minutes. And to a preacher, that means absolutely nothing. Psalms 85, verse 8. I will hear what God the, the Lord will speak. For he will speak peace to his people and to his saints. But let them not turn back to folly. So listen, the key, my friend, the key to overcoming anxiety and depression is the peace of God. It's totally the opposite. Anxiety will get you all crazy. The peace of God will, will just bring you to that place where you will know that he is the Lord. That's why in the midst of that, he wanted to speak in a still small voice. He wanted to speak in peace. Are y'all here? But notice what he says. He says, I will hear what, what God the Lord will speak. Yeah, well, what is, what is he going to speak? Peace. When, when, um, when Jesus got into the boat with the disciples and he went to sleep, you know why he went to sleep? Because he had peace. And the winds came and the storm was blowing and the disciples, they thought they were going to die. I mean, you may read it and go like, wow. But if you were in it, it's, it's traumatic, man. You think you're going to die. The storm is, is dark. The rain is blowing. And Jesus was going to deal with the storm. And how did he deal with it? They woke him up and he said, peace. Oh, you're not hearing me. So what do we do? When you're going through it, my friend, what do you do? Speak peace. Oh, my God, I don't know what to do. I don't know. All right. Speak peace. And he said, peace, be still. And it stopped. What do you focus on? What do you say? If you have to say anything, my friend, speak peace. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Are you all with me? Next verse says, real quick, Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him or respect him, that glory may dwell in our land. Next verse says, Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. Oh, that's awesome. So let me give you a clue about how to walk and attain peace. You have to embrace your righteousness. Righteousness and peace, they kiss. Why is that important? Because when the time comes, just like Elijah, you know, when the time comes when you don't know what's happening, why it's happening, and you're going crazy, one of the first things people do is think that it's their fault. Are you all with me? Maybe this is happening because I did this. If that, if that was true, you'd be done already. Oh, yeah, you, you, you'd be gone from the earth already because you know how, much, how many mistakes we make? The Bible says that we are what? His righteousness in Christ Jesus. You cannot change that. You know why? Because it's not about you. 
It's about Christ. Our righteousness is not based on what you do and what you say and how you did it or what you didn't do. Your righteousness is based on Christ. We are the righteousness of God in, say in, in Christ Jesus. And why is that so important, my friend? Because when you know your identity and you know who you are and you know that you are a son and a daughter of God and you know that you are righteous by faith in the son of God, then when the crap hits the fan, Come on. Because you know who you are and you know it's not your fault and you know God is not trying to punish you because if God wanted to punish you, trust me, you'll be done. And when you know who you are, guess what? Peace comes. Righteousness and peace will kiss. I love that verse. Okay. Hallelujah. I see how excited you guys are. I know I'm competing with with burgers and all that, but <laughs> help a brother out. Get, get fed spiritually a little bit, then we go for the for the other stuff. Amen. So, Matthew 6, we we know these. 6, verse 26. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not, what, of more value than they? Next verse. Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? Next verse. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Next verse. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Next verse. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? So let me go back to a whole series that I did. I'm not going to share the whole series, obviously. But it, the, it was about the fight of faith. And so you, you always, the Bible says we go from faith to faith. It doesn't say you stay in the same level of faith. What you perceive as a problem may be just a stepping stone to your next level of faith. That's all. And, and so then this is what he's saying, man. You're worrying about tomorrow, and tomorrow don't even exist yet. And he says, I'm going to tell you why you're worrying. Because your faith needs to go to the next level. Come on. This is what he's saying. He said, don't trip. Don't worry, man. You know, God is God. He's the provider. He is Jehovah Jireh, your provider. But why is it that you're feeling this way? And why are you doubting, O ye, of little faith? Now, there's three levels of faith in the Bible that we see. You have no faith, little faith, or great faith. That's why we go from faith to faith Glory to glory. If you stay in the same level of faith, my friend, it will be terrible. Because everything, the challenges that come our way, the purpose of those challenges is for us to take the next level of faith. But if you stay in that same level, guess what? Those challenges are going to come back over and over and over again. Boy, you got even quiet up in here. Huh? Next verse. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? Next verse. For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Next verse. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be what? Added to you. Now remember, you can only seek the kingdom through faith. Next verse. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Next verse. Is that it? Okay, you robbed me from one verse. No, no. So, so you see what, the, what Jesus is saying. He is saying you're going to have anxiety if you're worrying about things 
that I have control over. You're worrying about things that I am so willing to give you. But you have to believe in me. And the time to believe God is when you're going through stuff. And, and you know, when everything is cool, you know, we, we, we're fine. We thank the Lord. But when the challenges come, that's the time to rise up to the next level of faith. Amen. That's the time to say, you know what? I'm not going to let my mind take me where I shouldn't go. I'm not going to let my mind rule because I have the mind of Christ. So that's why Paul says in Philippians, think on these things. If we didn't have the ability to think, he wouldn't say that. Always ask yourself, what am I thinking about and why am I thinking it? Amen? Because we have a choice. I could think on the Word of God and see the Word of God in my life or I can worry and that does nothing for you or anybody else. Amen. I want to pray for you guys. We have a lot more in this area, so come next Sunday. But I want you to stand to your feet. And I said during our time of prayer that even though we know these things. The Bible says, cast your cares upon the Lord because he cares for you. It's not that easy. It's not easy at all. But that's why we need each other and we need the corporate body. Listen to me carefully. Give yourself to the word of God more than anything. Let the Word of God be the most important thing in your life. If you're not a reader, get the Bible on CD or, or on a stick. Listen to it all the time. Because what comes here, whatever you hear, will, will get you thinking in that direction. Are y'all here? Right? So get into the Word of God. If we had church four times a week, you know what I would say? Be at church four times a week. What? Because I have an ego problem? No. But God has put me here as a shepherd. And he loves you guys through us. We're for you. There's people that can call me at any time. There's people that say, man, this is what I'm strong. I'm always responding. Why? That is who God called us to be. I want you to succeed more than anything. But at the same time, I realize what needs to be done to succeed. You can read 10 books on how to succeed in business and so on. Those are not my books. The book that I subscribe to is the one that helps you succeed in every area of life. Because you can have all the money you need, but yet be miserable in a relationship. Oh, y'all here. But we don't meet four times a week. We have prayer on Thursday night, which I encourage you to come out one hour. Can we not invest? Get out of your cave at times and come and hear the word of God. Right? We have Sunday at max two hours out of a week come and hear the word value the word of God and it will change your life the more you hear it the more it will change you amen raise your hands all over this place come on hallelujah hallelujah father we thank you we thank you Lord for your love your grace your mercy toward us Lord we thank you father that that your heart is to heal us, to bless us, to prosper us. And you've given us, Lord, the tools uh, in your word, Father, to apply and to succeed in those areas. And Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that if there's anyone here right now that is in the cave, that they will come out, that they would declare, Lord, I'm, I'm, I want to be used of you. I want to advance the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter how I feel. It doesn't matter what people say. It, my circumstances don't matter. Lord, I must seek your kingdom first and your righteousness. And we know that all these things will be added unto us. 
Father, I thank you that we're going to bless this city, West Chicago and the surrounding cities. Lord, that we're going to be used of you to bring people to the kingdom. We will bring them at your feet. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we declare that we are a church that is not selfish. We are a church that believes in giving of our time, giving of our money, giving our prayers to save and to bless others. Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing in our hearts. Thank you, Lord, that anxiety and depression does not have to be in our lives. We will continue, Lord, to pray and to seek you. We will continue to walk in our identity. We know who we are. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We are sons and daughters of the living God. We are kings and priests. Father, we are those that are seated in heavenly places with you. We are co-laborers with Christ. We thank you, Lord. It's who we are. We represent you on the earth. And so, Lord, I pray for miracles, breakthroughs in people's hearts and minds. That when we leave this place, that only peace will rest upon us. You said in Isaiah, that perfect peace is on the mind that has stayed on you. Help us to focus on you and you alone. Help us to make you the most important person in our lives. And we thank you, Father, for it. Now, Lord, as we go into the picnic... Bless the food, bless the fellowship, and that we will continue, Lord, to realize that you are with us and for us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Love you.